Well, in line with the declaration of a national emergency on food security by the federal government, three northern governors have visited President Bola Tinubu uh, to brief him on their preparations. Mohamed Bago of Niger State, Umar Namadi of Jigawa State, and Inoua Yahaya of Gombe State visited President Tinubu at the presidential villa. Governor Bago told reporters that his administration has signed an agreement for 250,000 hectares of land uh, to be made available uh, for the dry season farming. While Governor Namadi revealed that uh, Jigawa State has received approval for 40,000 hectares of land uh, for wheat farming. And out of the 120,000 uh, requested for the Fadama project, Governor Yahaya says Gombe State is prepared for food security. Well, for more on Nigeria's state of uh, food insecurity, I have African farmer Mogaji, a food security expert, joining me on the program from our Lagos studio. Uh, thank you so much, African farmer Mogaji. Uh, it's good to see you and Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year, Ngozi. Good to be here. Great. Thank you for having me. Yes. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, the, the president, in his New Year speech, actually laid out, uh, you know, plans for agriculture, you know, to ensure food uh, security in Nigeria. He says, look, I need constant supply of food in the country, uh, security, and, of course, affordability. Uh, let's begin from there. What are the foundations that need to be laid for this to become reality? Well, um, thank you. Uh, fundamentally, the major foundation that needs to be laid is that um, the, the conversation needs to move beyond poverty elevation and making food available to uh, prosperity promoting prosperity. Once we have the mindset of promoting prosperity, we will get to the promised land. But if it is still poverty elevation, the people will see a lot of AIDS. The private sector will see a lot of AIDS. The developmental partners will see a lot of aid. But when it is prosperity promotion, people will begin to see business. That is fundamental in this conversation. And, um, also, there's a lot of focus on production, 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 which has been consistent since 1999. Nigeria does not necessarily need more production. Nigeria needs more productivity, which means using the same space of land to get in double. Let me explain that. Um, there are particular seeds of like tomatoes that we use in Nigeria. These tomatoes, the farmers get like six tons from 15 plots of land, that's a football, um, 15 plots of land, that is an hectare, which is a football field. Now, that same seed, if you take it to Netherlands and some places in Kenya and in Ghana, those seeds produce 20 tons minimum. What is needed is the input. The same space of land in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Ghana, you know, and Netherlands produces more. So what I'm saying is, we need more productivity against production, production, increasing land uh, mass. And also, uh, if you watch the presidential um, speech during his inauguration, he spoke heavily about livestock. Gradually, the livestock conversation is being eroded out of all this conversation. It is plant millet, plant corn, and other staples. When we don't plan adequately for our livestock, all other assumptions get to be challenged. Livestock consumes the highest of the grains we produce. So if we don't produce or if we don't project to produce specifically for them alongside what is meant for consumption and industrialization, all these plans don't work. So gradually we are beginning, I'm beginning to see a trend of slipping into recycling old models. But livestock is crucial. We need to focus on livestock. If we budget and project for livestock, we will meet human uh, production needs. Uh, let's stay on that. I mean, you're saying that the government needs to focus on livestock. How much of a game changer, uh, game changer would it be? What, I mean, uh, paint a picture of what livestock can do for Nigeria's economy. <laughs> 
So in terms of nutrition, one of the major challenges we have um, um, with children under five and under 14, in all the conversations that we've been having over the years, you, one, you won't hear nutrition in saying we want to plant corn. Nutrition, protein is crucial for our children's development. We don't hear of nutrition for, and livestock, which is mostly poultry. Poultry, poultry consumption uh, and production takes a chunk of the grains, especially the soya and the corn. And we don't, pro we don't plan for those. We import quite a lot of grains that we, you know, that goes to that sector. Once, and it thinks it's, it's in the range of our 40 to 50% of the maize product produced in Nigeria goes into that sector, outside humans. So in terms of livestock, most of the cattle we produce, if we are going, in, if we're going to intensify our modern uh, cattle production, um, rabbitry, name it, um, even snails, name it, whatever livestock we want to produce for our protein needs, it is basically maize and soya. And those two, we're not planning for it. As I speak to you, the poultry sector or poultry value chain in Nigeria is almost dead. When I say almost dead, I mean almost dead. COVID played a major impact and uh, the farmer error and insecurity also, you know, uh, has made it, you know, really go high. But bottom line is we're focusing too much right now on the northern production. The syllabus has changed. We need to focus on the eastern and the southern part of the country now because of the challenges happening in the, in the northern um, environment. But most importantly, a challenge that we have not really been paying attention to, which is climate change. Just yesterday, it rained heavily, causing floods in some areas in Lagos. And this is January. If climate change this year brings a lot of rains, and let's say from we have another major one in January, if it's consistent in February, then what that means is that all permutations will be thrown off the table. Then Nigeria will be faced a lot with nutrition and availability and affordability of food. That conversation of climate change is not currently being seen in the assumptions. Now, projects don't fail in Nigeria. It's the assumptions in, in preparing those projects that fail, that is wrong. And as, I, and as, I, as it looks like, we are having wrong assumptions feeding some of the projects that is being uh, projected, which eventually comes to livestock and nutrition. Uh, well, uh, African farmer, like you know, uh, they say if you uh, do the same thing over and over again and expect the same or a different result, uh, it equals uh, insanity. I mean, I recall uh, the Green Revolution, there's been Operation Feed the Nation, there's been Anchor Borrower Scheme, there's been all kinds of, uh, you know, plans, including the National Agriculture Development uh, Fund that's just been emplaced by this uh, government. Um, what are the pitfalls uh, that we need to, you know, uh, run away from so that whatever plans this government has, it, like this one, National Agric Development Fund, you know, does not uh, fall flat on its face? So the good thing um, that I've seen happen with this administration is with the national funds that they created, it's a player, a practical player that is adding uh, that uh, parastatal and not just a, a player, a practical player is also a young fellow. So the zeal is there, the network is there. He knows what to do if the policies and bureaucracies will allow him work is another ball game. But the administration has done something by bringing the right person on the table. Um, one conversation that I have not also seen now, which is making us look, making us see that we may be going down the same trajectory is that implementation that we're hearing is not talking about regional. We're still trying to do a one size fit all conversation with agriculture. If we look back to the Namdi Azikwe, Tafa Balewa, Awolowo, what worked then was regional agriculture. Now our cultures are different, even though we're in the same country. 
The way the eastern person manages and operates agriculture is different from the way the southwest does that. And it's different from the north. And it has different dynamics. Like the north is more commercial. The north is more exposed in terms of using uh, updated inputs and co. And they spend more money on agriculture than other parts of the country. So, and labor is relatively available there. So right now, we're still seeing a design of project that wants what is happening in the north to happen in the south. We have different soil types. Most of the soil in the north is loose. Any tractor will function well there. In the south, and I mean south, 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 east, southwest, the lands are more heavy. We need you know, heavier tractors here. So all the plans we're seeing is still saying, Nigeria, Nigeria. We have to break it down to regional to be able to feed this country. And also, when it comes to culture, we are undermining the place of culture in uh, food security in Nigeria. It's not something we bring on the table yet. So we need that to also come on the table. And another crucial thing that may make all these plans not work is we're still having a, instead of having a bottom-up approach, we're having it from bottom down. This is what they need, and we shove it down their throat. That is still what I'm seeing. Instead of, you know, giving the farmers what they need, the farmers need more tractors to be available to them. Once the tractors are more available to them, they can work. But the tractors are not available in the country. Okay. Very quickly, you know, the African inputs farmer. we need are not available. Yeah. Uh, very yeah. quickly. There are some fundamental things I want to I want us to achieve in this uh, discussion. Number one, how do you make agriculture attractive, you know, to the Nigerian youth? I mean, how do you make how do you make agriculture, um, you know, sexy for the Nigerian youth? They make up uh, 65, 70 percent of the population and they still see going to the farm as punishment. What do we need to do to attract them? <laughs> first thing first is. I can speak on that because I started in my secondary school. And so what I say is we need to make agriculture a bit fun. Fun because the youth of today understand entertainment and fun. We need to bring entertainment into agriculture. We need to bring more artists to sing, encourage them to sing songs, you know, entertainment in agriculture. That's crucial. Number two, the average Nigerian youth wants to see the money. Show them the math to the money. You put in X, you're supposed to put, um, you know, invest your time for three months. This is the output. Show them the money. Show them uh, entertainment, how they can be entertained in it, or how they can bring entertainment in it. And three is show them the different value chains, the different areas that match up with their personality. We don't bring personality into agriculture yet. So for somebody who is introverted, you don't want the person to be saying we are going into sales. We need to bring personalities of individuals or the personality test into agriculture so people can align with what, where they belong to. But entertainment is crucial. The youths are always on their phone. Even the rural youths, they are on their phone into one form of entertainment. Get the likes of the Fuji artists, you know, uh, and their con counterparts in other tribes uh, to come in, you know, and we will get things done in a short while. Those three crucial. We tick those boxes, the youth will run into agri. Would you also like to tick the box on the issue of, um, you know, agri loans, agriculture loans at single digits? That's an argument that's been made over and over again as part of, you know, the ways that you can actually attract these young people. Let's talk about uh, agri loans. Well, agri loans is crucial. But from my experience spanning almost three decades now operating across the country, um, it's not a function of the loans being available. It's practical knowledge. Knowledge is always missing. So when the digits, when the single digits come in, you know, it, it's challenging. But the loans is crucial to be available when it is needed. And, you know, for government not to handle it, over the years, it has not worked. They can put those monies, especially in the microfinance. Is the microfinance that is in the local governments where this agriculture takes place. 
not in the commercial banks. Almost all the monies in the commercial banks, you know, have had challenges. It's the five C's of credit. It's the same yardstick you use, they use for commercial loans that they use for uh, micro loans for the farmers. But some banks have developed um, expertise, you know, just a few. There are, are less than four in the country that have developed that expertise that can cascade this working with microfinance. But microfinance and cooperatives, that is where government needs to put the money and attach them to just about four of those banks. And these four banks, some of them have national and regional um, approach. That is what works. We need the funding, but we need it given at the right time with the right parastata working with them, but government should not handle any project that has money. It has not worked in about 24 years, and I don't see it working because most of the people there don't have the experience and the exposure to implement this project. And with uh, funding, adequate funding, you can now begin to talk about uh, mechanized farming. And I've been hearing about mechanized farming uh, all my life, and it still seems that we're not able to move in that direction. What exactly is hampering us, and uh, how can we overcome uh, those challenges? Now, so mechanization is one of the reasons why Nigeria is not food secure, not necessarily um, uh, uh, the insecurity of farmer edda, mechanization. Because everything is still manual in this country. Everything is manual. So the, the northerners that produce a chunk, well over 60, 70% of our food, a chunk of them are doing manual. So when it comes to mechanization, it's no rocket science. In India, China, Malaysia, basically Asia, we just need to copyright what they are doing. They use small equipments. They have the same, uh, um, everything in, in Asia is like Nigeria. So we need small equipment, not those big equipment. We're trying to copy Europe and US who don't have the same structure like we do. So small equipment for spraying, people can still use something similar to hoe, but what reduces the time, removes the drudgery. So the equipment, mechanization is everything, but mostly mechanization from production to modular processing. All those giant projects has not worked, and it may not work. From the time of Aulawa till date, those giant projects get moribund. There are many of them all over the country, and we need something small that people can handle in local governments. Everything mechanization should be local government based now. If it is not local government based, it won't work. If it is state based, it won't work. Local government, rural based. Small equipment for spraying, instead of jacking the, the pump, you know, they are motorized. So they do the job half of the time required. So there are, there are equipments now with small tractors. You can use it to plow on the soil. You can use it to level the soil. You can attach equipment to it to irrigate. You can attach a five-ton trailer to it and pull. This mechanization is whatever helps the farmer to be self-sustainable. Um, sus that it doesn't need external. Currently, the tractors, you have to book. It's like three weeks before the tractors get to you. Wow. So mechanization is crucial. If we get mechanization right, we'll feed this country. Uh, absolutely. And you, you, you say that at the state level it may not work. Are you saying this um, plan... Uh, you know, where you have the, some northern governors, you have uh, Jigawa, Niger State, and uh, Gombe visiting the president, you know, talking about uh, collaboration in agriculture. Are you saying it's not really going to work? Because Jigawa governor, for example, has been saying, look, we're doing very well in wheat production. I'd like you to, you know, think about that. And then again, I want to ask a question that the ordinary man on the streets wants to ask. Why is local rice so expensive? Why is it still more expensive than foreign rice? What exactly are we not doing right? And why can't we take advantage of our potentials in wheat uh, production? Okay, so I'll start with the rice. So we don't have the comparative advantage on rice. We've just been forcing ourselves to grow the rice. But the amount of research and uh, personnel, personnel and capacity development has gone to rise in India, in China, in other countries. We've not put in half of it, even Egypt. So our cost is very high. Land preparation is high. Transportation is high. Everything is high. So when you finish, before you harvest your rice, 
the ones they are importing will be cheaper. So we've not, we've paid a lot of attention to produce, produce, produce. We've processing, logistics. If we take care of logistics, to transport a bag of rice is part of what makes rice expensive. You know, so we've not taken advantage of rice. In fact, when, you, when we look at even seeds, we're shouting rice for over the years. Do the rice seed companies in the country, do they have the funding to produce the seed? We don't have enough seeds to grow the rice we want in this country. So the conversation is not, you know, in the right place. We've, we have been talking about many things, scratching it, but the real things, we're not talking about it. If government puts money in logistics and the farmers produce the rice, rice will be available. Then two, I always say this, we are not producing the rice the market wants. We're forcing rice on people, rice with high starch, rice that you will cook that will become soggy. This is over eight years. Let me say this. Since President Gowan, Nigeria has been funding one project on rice till date. Look at how long that is, and we're not sustainable yet. We may need to begin to rethink if we need to be pushing that rice conversation, you know, that big. Or should we use some rice? Should we focus on some rice that we can turn to ground rice, not edible rice, and import the remaining? Israel exports water, but yet their water is salty. There are conversations that we need to have. Data that we, they will use to produce the rice is wrong. We don't have right data um, for the rice production also. So, you know, these things, we, we just pick most of the data we use, we pick from abroad. There's no data that is locally uh, sorted, generated, so we can't get the result. So I, I've lost thought on the second question you asked, please. Uh, wheat potential. I mean, Jigawa State actually, you know, says it, it has yes. uh, the highest uh, wheat production levels uh, in Nigeria and could even do uh, a lot more. Very quickly on, on that one, because I want to find out okay. from you, African farmer, uh, talk about commodities exchange, uh, dressing wastage, special agri processing zones as part of the ways that Nigeria can actually move forward on agriculture. Okay, so as regards, fortunately, Gombe, Jigawa are very comfort areas that have operated projects for years. I can tell you categorically um, that the governors need to go and revisit the assumptions. Gombe, Jigawa produces wheat of what comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis climate change, which cannot be produced all year round as we speak in the country. It's towards the dry season. It needs the weather to be cool to be able to produce at some point in time. Bottom line is, the farmers, Gombe has been producing wheat. Have the farmers been prosperous producing wheat? The farmers have been producing. They've not been, productivity has not been there. So the conversation they went to have with the, with the presidency and the president, the president needs to review and ask them to prove you know, why the, pre uh, the, the president should partner with them. With data, the data is not available. They have more comparative advantage. Nigeria does not have a comparative advantage on wheat. We have on millet, we have on sorghum. We have on corn, but we don't have on wheat. We've struggled there long enough. It's not that we should not produce, we should produce, but we are putting too much money than the yield. What's the yield of wheat from, from Jigawa? It's um, low, okay. extremely low. I've produced wheat in Jigawa. Yeah. Farmer, a last one. And I am very concerned about this. Our okay. yams no longer uh, taste or smell the same. As a matter of fact, you buy yam today, by tomorrow, it's gone. It's gone bad. Sweet potato is not as sweet as it used to be. What exactly is going on? Wrong chemicals or what? Is there a need to train farmers on the kind of chemicals to use? Now, so when you, when you talk about sweet potatoes, you know, and, and others, we're using, the type of fertilizers we're using is not making our food have longer shelf life. So we use too, many, too much nitrate fertilizers. That's why you buy tomatoes, they rot fast. You buy your sweet potato, it rot fast. You buy your yams, they are over, overusing fertilizers so the yams grow big. And let me say this to you. Many farmers now, especially in some regions of the country, are resulting to charms to produce the yams because it's, labor is not available, again, to put yams on vines. They use charms now, and they don't even eat those yams. The yams they eat, 
They don't use charms to produce it. These are things that when we are planning for yam, yam, national yam things, when they are using charms and not depending on science, then what that means is that assumptions will be wrong. We can't get the result. Special um, agricultural processing zones. One of the challenges, I, it's a good initiative, but we need to have special crops, let's say special pineapples, special um, or plant pineapples. So pineapples of same varieties to be produced to go into those equipments. Those equipments are highly sensitive equipment. So we don't have state governments and local governments planning for varieties that will fit ultra modern factories. So those factories will be built and it will be moribund again. The commodities exchange is a good one. Um, you know, the plans and uh, operations are still good. We're waiting and to see how the implementation uh, will go. A lot of fundamentals are wrong because we have many experts uh, advising governments at all levels who have exposure but don't have experience. They've traveled abroad, they've written theses, They've went, gone for seminars, but they've not been in the field. They've not lost money. Anybody who has not lost money cannot be advising. It's been very colossal in the last four or five years for practitioners. They are either in debt, struggling, or they are stagnant. Those are the people that need to come together to say, this is what we need. And government should listen to that and avoid recycling mistakes. Currently, it's still not happening. Avoid recycling mistakes. Uh, African farmer Mogaji, thank you so much. It is shocking to hear that farmers now use charms to grow their yams.